Christmas in my family, we have a specific routine, a tradition, if you will, that we follow. No, we don't celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday, but it's a time of family, a time to be together, to give gifts, to reflect on the past year, and to look forward to the next. As part of that tradition, we have different movies that we like to watch, wholesome family movies that are hard to find nowadays. One of these movies was recorded in the 1980s when you could actually do that on your own tapes that you could put in your uh, video library, not on a DVR. And it has all the commercials. And when you examine those commercials, you watch those commercials, it's amazing how commercials have changed. There's not one drug commercial, not one alcohol commercial in the entire show. There are things being advertised that don't even exist today anymore. And we watch the commercials. I don't usually like watching commercials, but when you watch old things, that's part of the show. And we tried to transfer this onto DVD because VHS tapes deteriorate over time and DVDs will last longer. The movie itself is called The Muppets Family Christmas. And it's a funny movie where the Muppets all try to get together for Christmas in the home of Fozzie Bear's mother. And there are so many of them that some of them have to sleep hanging on, uh, hanging on hooks on the wall. And in fact, a lot of our family's inside jokes come from that movie. Near the end of the movie, once they're all together, they have a sing-along with many of the secular Christmas songs. And one of these songs is my mom's favorite. And it lends itself to the title of today's lesson, which is, It's in Every One of Us. The song itself was written by David Pomeranz, and it is not a religious song. But its words can have biblical application if you dig deeper into them. The song's main verse goes like this. It's in every one of us to be wise. Find your heart, open up both your eyes. We can all know everything without ever knowing why. It's in every one of us, by and by. It is those words that I would like us to focus our thoughts here this afternoon as it concerns a biblical perspective on those words. The song began, it's in every one of us. So often in the religious world, you hear preachers say that mankind is incapable of knowing the will of God without God miraculously opening his heart and pouring in what is necessary in order for man to be saved. What verses do they use to try and show this? Well, there are verses like Jeremiah 17, verse 9, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? They use verses like Romans 3, verses 10 to 12, which says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And verses like 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 16, which says, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is, who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What preachers who have used these verses in this way, what they have done is they have done proof texting. Using verses to teach something without reading the whole context. And sometimes we can get away with that. As long as both the speaker and the audience know what the context is. And that the verse is not being taken out of its context. However, when we proof text, it is easy, very easy, to take the verses out of context and make them teach something that they don't. Let's go back and examine the three verses that I talked about. In the case of Jeremiah 17, verse 9, let's read the broader context, starting at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. This passage is not talking about man's inability to know the will of God because of the sins of the heart. In fact, it is teaching quite the opposite. If we trust in man, we will not be saved because man does not lead us to God. If, however, we trust in the Lord, we will come to God because we will accept the way in which he leads us. But notice from verse 10, how does God judge us according to the fruit of man's actions, according to the ways that man chooses in response to God? God knows the heart. He knows us and therefore will judge us properly. But we have the ability to obey God or not. We just have to trust the Lord and follow the Lord's teachings, which are found in the Bible. Writing Romans 3, verses 10 to 12, let's examine the product context there by starting at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
in this context, which we really didn't have time to fully read, go back to Romans 2 and start there, and you'll get the very much broader context. What Paul is trying to combat here, though, is this Jewish attitude that they were better than the Gentiles because they had the law of Moses and that somehow they could be saved by the law of Moses. Paul is teaching here that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is nobody who could say to God that they don't need God's grace. The problem with the Jews' argument, though, is that the law of Moses couldn't save them because the law of Moses couldn't deal with the sin problem. For the blood of bulls and goats cannot remit sin. And since everyone sinned, both Jew and Gentile, everyone needs a Savior, Jesus, who will save everybody the same way through faith in him. What about verse 11? where it says nobody understands, no one seeks after God. Well, if you notice, there's a cross-reference there. Paul is referring to Psalms 14, verses 1 to 4. So let's go back there and read that passage so that we know how Paul is using it. Psalms 14, beginning of verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Let me ask you, why is it that people in this passage were corrupt? Why was it nobody did good? Why was there nobody who understood? Because they have said in their heart, there is no God. And that's really who the passage is talking about. Those who say there is no God. They are fools for saying this. Did David mean in this psalm that people are incapable of finding God? No, otherwise they wouldn't be fools. You could only be a fool if you are capable of knowing better. These people were fools because they actively chose not to believe in God. And when you do this, you're not going to be righteous, and you're going to go further on down the road of sin. So when Paul uses this passage in Romans, he is not saying that man is incapable of finding God. He is saying that man is incapable to save himself apart from faith in Christ. But that faith doesn't come from God. It comes from hearing and believing the word of God, according to Romans 10, 17. This is something that man is capable of doing. What then about 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 16? To know what Paul is speaking about there, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but we are going to go back to verse 1 of that chapter. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning of verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The Corinthians had a problem. They trusted in the wisdom of men. And as we'll see shortly, the wisdom of man will not lead us to God. We need to follow after the wisdom of God, which is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Holy Spirit reveals God's will to us through the scriptures. For 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given to us by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Without the revelation of the Holy Spirit, mankind would be incapable of knowing the will of God because God is the only one who knows his will before he reveals it. However, the Holy Spirit did reveal his will to the apostles and inspired prophets. 
They wrote it down in what we call the New Testament. And therefore, we can read and understand what the will of God is. It's just that simple. God doesn't have to miraculously open our heart and force us to believe him. The word of God opens our heart and we actively choose to obey him. It's in every one of us. Don't believe me? Well, let's take a look at what God spoke through Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, let's begin reading at verse 11. Deuteronomy 30, beginning of verse 11. This is an important verse for later, so do pay attention. Deuteronomy 30, beginning of verse 11. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should, that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may see, sorry, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. The children of Israel had been presented with blessings and cursings, with life and death. They had a choice. Which would they choose? It was a free choice, one that they had the ability to make. God pleaded with them to obey, and some did, but most didn't. Today, God presents us with a similar choice. Obey Jesus Christ through faith and be saved, or disobey and be lost. It's in every one of us to make that choice. We are capable of doing it, of making it. We just have to do it. Returning to our song from the beginning, though, it's in every one of us to be wise. When it comes to this life, there are two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. What does the Bible say about the wisdom of man? Proverbs 3 verse 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 1 Corinthians 1 beginning of verse 18 says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are, sorry, the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God 
and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. What does the wisdom of this world teach? To believe in evolution, because after all, the scientist has proven it, even though they haven't. The wisdom of this world teaches that it is foolish to believe that one man could die on the cross for every sin that has ever been committed. And the wisdom of this world teaches us that there is nothing after death, that we just cease to exist. So live it up now while we can. Eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The wisdom of this world leaves us with no hope. What about true wisdom? The wisdom from God. What does the Bible teach us about that? Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. True wisdom does not begin by looking out at the stars. It begins with the fear of the Lord. The respecting of the Lord is the only true God, for it is he who possesses all wisdom, and it is his word that provides us that wisdom. Proverbs 10, verse 8 says, The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. There are many people on this earth who think that they know everything. They think that they have all knowledge. They are wrong. Do you want to be wise? Be willing to receive instruction. Recognize that others may know something that you do not, and be ready to listen. Recognize that God does know something that you do not and be ready to listen. And what does the wisdom of God teach? In 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 10, we read, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iaconium and Lystra. What persecutions I have endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus." All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, truly equipped for every good work. The wise man studies the scriptures, which imparts to us the wisdom of God, salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy studied this from his childhood, from before he was a Christian. He was able to read and understand what the scriptures said. They said that he had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They said that he needed to repent. And in his day, like it is now, that led him to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Scripture said that following baptism, following initial obedience to God, he needed to walk faithfully in the ways of God until death loving God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. In short, again, the scriptures taught Timothy the way of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. They didn't teach him how to get rich or how to have physical power, but they taught him all that he needed to know to live a godly life and overcome persecution and obtain eternal life. Knowing this, See then that we walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, as Paul said in Ephesians 5.15. It's in every one of us to be wise. Let's therefore be wise in the ways of God. In order to do that, we have to find our heart and open up both our eyes. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Having poor spiritual eyesight might cause cause us to not recognize that the person we're following is blind also and can lead us into a ditch. The Jews of Jesus' day had a problem. 
They were following the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And those people were blind themselves. So in following blindly the blind teachers, the Jews became blind themselves and fell into a ditch. But that is where false teaching leads. Jesus wasn't a blind teacher. He was able to pull people out of the ditch and restore their eyesight with the truth of God, allowing them to see again. But they had to be willing to hear the word of God and accept what Jesus told them to do. Perhaps one of the toughest things we have to deal with when we go out and teach is when we run into someone who has a hard heart, a heart that is resistant to the will of God. We don't want to abandon them, for we know what their condition is and what the result will be if they don't obey. But we need to remember what the scriptures say about a person with a hard heart. In Acts 19, beginning of verse 8, there we read, And he went to the synagogue, that being Paul, and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some of them were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. When people hardened their hearts, Paul went to preach to those who would listen. You can think of the heart like clay. When clay is soft, it can easily be molded into whatever we want. But what happens when we allow the clay to harden? It will become brittle and break easily, and we can't mold it into anything. Can it be softened again? Yes, but it takes a lot of effort and time. When we let our hearts get into a hardened condition, it is very difficult for it to be softened. That's because what hardens the heart is usually stubbornness, pride, or rebellion, things we don't like to give up. The word of God is able to, to soften the heart, though, for Hebrews 4, verse 12 says, the full, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But if a person hardens their heart to the word, let's not think of us as powerful enough on our own to soften the heart. They have to make the choice. But notice again, we are able to soften our hearts if we will but hear the word of God. How many times did Jesus say in his ministry, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It didn't require some miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. It required for man to listen to the words of the Holy Spirit. Going back to Romans 10 now, let's read the broader context to Romans 10, 17 that we referred to earlier, starting at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. By the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will send, descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Remember, that's what Deuteronomy said that we read earlier. The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess your, with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. 
For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Look at all those action words in this passage. Confess, believe, call, and hear. All of those things are things that mankind can do and mankind is expected to do. But it all starts with the word of God. It starts with hearing and believing the word of God, which calls us to confess Jesus and call on his name through baptism in order to be saved. It's in every one of us to be wise, but we need to soften our hearts to the word of God and open up both of our eyes so that we can understand and obey it. If we do this, we can all, all know everything that God wants us to know, even if we never know all the whys. Why did God create the universe the way he did? Why did he make us carbon-based organisms and not silicon-based organisms? I don't know. Why does this universe behave the way that it does? Or the body works the way that it does? We know a lot of what the body does, but why does it work that way? I don't know. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross for the sins of mankind? Couldn't God have done it another way? I don't know. Why did God choose baptism for the remission of sins? Why not faith only? I don't know. And I don't need to know. For ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do and die. God has given us everything we need to know. For 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who, obtained, who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by, his, by glory and virtue, by which, have been, by which have, been, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord, and Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is not one thing that we need to know in order to be saved that God hasn't revealed to us in his word. The Gnostics of the late first century were perverting the gospel of Christ by saying, that they had additional knowledge that one needed to know in order to be saved and that you needed to join them in order to obtain that knowledge. God denies that. God's knowledge isn't mystical. It is understandable and attainable for every one of us. But even with the necessary knowledge that God imparts to us, he doesn't always tell us the whys of everything. And that's okay. It's okay to say that I don't know or that the scriptures don't say. For if the scriptures don't say, it isn't important for us to know in order to please God. I don't need to know why God chose baptism. I just need to know that he did and commands me to submit to it in faith in order to be saved. I don't need to know why God demanded that, the, that Jesus shed his blood in order for sins to be remitted. I just need to understand that that's how God did it. I can know everything that God wants me to know without ever knowing why. So let's not use that as an excuse for not obeying God. So in conclusion then, it's in every one of us 
to be wise in the way that God wants us to be wise. We need to find our heart, though, and open up both our eyes to his will and obey it. We can all know everything that God wants us to know without ever knowing why. It's in every one of us, by and by. Let's therefore take this message out and teach the world the gospel, even in this coronavirus-filled holiday season. If, however, you're in the audience or are watching online and have yet to name the name of Christ, now is a good time to do so. If you're watching at home with others, tell them of your faith and desire to be baptized, and they can take you to a place of baptism. If you're watching alone at home, though, go to our website at eastendchurch.org, and you'll find our contact information there. Contact us, and we'll help you in any way we can. But if you're in the audience today and would like to obey Jesus, all it takes is a step. A step of faith to confess your belief in Jesus as the Son of God. And we will immediately take you to a place of baptism. I'm not ashamed to obey.